Okay, welcome back. Uh, today we're talking about three short stories. Mrs. Dutta writes a letter, marriage is a private affair, and everyday use. So make sure you've done the reading before you listen to the lecture. Okay, and also, once again, I recommend, if possible, that you print up uh, these uh, PDF files so that you can mark them up, at least paying attention to what are the passages that we're reading out loud as we go through it. Okay, and we'll start with Mrs. Dutta writes a letter. And I want to be talking especially about conflict and this idea of epiphany, uh, this sudden realization, the sudden recognition, which so often is really the indication of the climax. Okay, but we want to ask ourselves when we're talking about conflict, uh, one way of thinking about it is what is it that the person wants, probably the protagonist of the story, in this case, Mrs. Dutta, what is it that she wants, okay, and what is it that's keeping her from getting it? Now, it's tempting, I think, in this story to think, well, she wants to live her life as she wants to in Sunnyvale, California, uh, a life which is similar to what she's used to back in India, okay? And it's easy, I think, to point to, well, maybe her daughter-in-law is part of the problem. OK, but I think it's um, uh, my sense of this story is that it's more sort of an interior conflict. OK, and that part of what we need to tease out is, OK, well, what does she want? OK, and what's keeping her from, from having it? Is it just one person or is it sort of more of an inner conflict? OK, sort of the here's what I want, but here's the reality of the situation. OK, I can't have what I want. Um, and so we, the story begins, she's in the bathroom, she's up at 5 a.m., right? Because this is how she feels like she's supposed to be, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. This is what uh, mother is supposed to do. Um, and she, she wants to feel purposeful. And it's clear from the beginning, uh, she's not made to feel like, you know, she needs to do any work or that she needs purpose, okay? And if you recall, uh, that's part of why she left India in the first place, is that she believes that her place is with her family and she got sick. And she saw no reason uh, to get out of bed in the morning. Okay. Uh, on page 753, um, this really is sort of the, the sort of the, the, the hook of the story is at the very bottom, Mrs. Basu wrote, Are you happy in America? So her best friend back home writes a letter saying, Are you happy? And you would think she should be able to answer that easily. And she can't. Mrs. Dutta knows that Mrs. Basu, who had been her closest friend since they had both come from Joshpura Lane as young brides, cannot be fobbed off with the description of Fisherman's Wharf and the Golden Gate Bridge or even anecdotes involving grandchildren. And so she has been putting, her, putting off her reply while in her heart family loyalty battles with insidious feelings of... And then we don't find out what that is. But she turns from them quickly and will not name them even to herself. So I think this is a pretty clear indication it's an internal conflict, okay? It's between different sides of herself, okay? So an internal conflict doesn't necessarily mean, um, uh, or, or it means really it's sort of something going on inside of yourself, two parts of yourself sort of at war. Maybe you want to go to this, you've been invited to a party and you really want to go, but there might be somebody there you really don't want to see. OK, and so you're conflicted, you know, part of you wants to go and part of you says, maybe I better not or I don't want to. OK, and so what is it that she wants and what's keeping her from having it? And I think uh, Devakaruni, the author, doesn't really give us sort of an easy, quick answer. OK, because she she has these insidious feelings of but she doesn't want to. She, you know, she has family loyalty, but she doesn't really want to sort of face them um, herself. But as we go through, I think it's it's clear that whereas it seems that she was more sort of welcome in the family, um, uh, you know, and, oh, you know, mom, no, you don't have to do that. Or, you know, oh, this is wonderful. At first, she's cooking for them. If you look um, on page 755, at first, Shamali had been happy enough to have someone take over the cooking. It's wonderful to come home to a hot dinner, she'd say. Or mother, what crispy pad pads and your fish gravy is out of this world. Okay, so at first it's nice, this sort of ethnic food from home, you know, from, from her home country. Um, but recently she's taken to picking at her food. And once or twice from the kitchen, Mrs. Dada has caught wisps of words, intensely whispered, cholesterol, putting on weight, she's spoiling you. Okay, so this is Shimali, uh, or her husband calls her Molly. Um, you know, talking, okay, this was fine for a while, but now it's, um, you know, it's, it's 
it, it, having a house guest, okay? After a while, having a house guest gets to be a problem. And though Shimali always refuses when the children ask if they could have a burrito from the freezer instead, Mrs. Dada suspects that she would really like to say yes. It would be easier for her, Molly, to say, yeah, the kids can you know, go ahead and have a burrito, okay? And these kids are just typical American kids, right? They want what they want. They want freezer burritos more than ethnic food. You know, maybe they're not into fish gravy, okay? <clears throat> and then, next paragraph, the children... The heaviness pulls at Mrs. Dada's entire body when she thinks of them. Like so much in this country, they have turned out to be, again, that sort of pause. Yes, she might as well admit it, a disappointment. Okay, they're a disappointment because they're not typical Indian kids, okay? They're typical American kids. Um, and so, but, you know, that's not what she expects. And she expects, she sits down and she'll say, oh, when I was a little girl uh, back in Calcutta, and, you know, these are just sort of typical... Uh, uh, American kids, they're going to think, oh, God, how long is this story going to last, right? Okay, and so maybe they're just not that interested in the culture that she wants to bring. Um, okay. Um, and so she's thinking, well, you know, they're my grandchildren, but they just seem so weird to her when they talk about Power Rangers or, or the Spice Girls, we find out. Um, let's turn then to page... Um, oh. Let's turn to page, how about 758? Uh, and we find out she's kind of afraid of using the, the different machines, the, the washing machines. She would much rather um, uh, just wash them in the, in the bathtub and then hang them up, you know, on the back fence. Uh, this is what she's used to, and she's afraid of these machines, okay? And you could say, well, she's an older woman. You know, it, it certainly is understandable uh, that she's kind of, set in her ways. Uh, and again, it's easy to kind of point to, say, her daughter-in-law, Molly, and say, well, you know, she ought to be a little more flexible. And fair enough. But then again, this is her house, you know, and she, she didn't know that this is sort of what she was going to get um, and that uh, Mrs. Dutta was going to be sort of a, direct, a disruptive influence in her family, right? And so when she does things like this, uh, washing her clothes in the bathtub and hanging them up at the back fence, she says, if you look at the top of uh, 759, my small victory, my secret. Okay. And so that she's doing things kind of behind Molly's back, and this makes it sort of a victory. It's, it's her secret. Okay. Um, turn then, or we're going to turn to 761. We're right here at the second uh, complete uh, body, first complete body paragraph here. When she first arrived in Sagar's home, that's her son, Mrs. Dutta wanted to go over and meet her next-door neighbors, maybe take them some of her special rose water rascolas, as she had often done with Mrs. Basu. Okay, so I I grew up in American suburbs, and this is where she's living now, in a suburb in Sunnydale. Um, and I just know that when you are new to the neighborhood, it's not your job to go around bringing the more established neighbors food, right? Maybe they'll come to visit you and say, oh, welcome to the neighborhood, or maybe they'll bring you some food. But it's just simply a different custom, is that you don't go and introduce yourself to your new neighbors, okay? It's just different. But Shamali said she shouldn't. Such things were not the custom in California. She explained earnestly, you didn't just drop in on people without calling ahead. Uh, here, everyone's very, everyone was busy. They didn't sit around chatting, drinking endless cups of sugar tea. Why, they might even say something unpleasant to her. Which would be unkind, but Molly's concerned about this. And Molly probably has a, a keener insight into, you know, how things are done in Sunnyvale. For what, Mrs. Dada had asked disbelievingly. And Molly had said, because Americans don't like neighbors to, here she used an English phrase, invade their privacy. Mrs. Dutta, who didn't fully understand the word privacy because there was no such term in, term in Bengali, had gazed at her daughter-in-law in some bewilderness, but she understood enough not to ask again. In the following months, though, she often looked over the fence, hoping to make contact. So again, if you grow up in the suburbs where everybody has an eight-foot fence uh, separating you know, your backyard from your neighbor's backyard, um, you just don't go looking over the fence, hoping to make eye contact with somebody. OK, people were people, whether in India or America, and everyone appreciated a friendly face. Well, maybe not. You know, she doesn't quite have this concept of uh, sort of the 
privacy, you know, the privacy of your own backyard, that sort of thing. She just doesn't quite make sense to her. And so she's poking her head over the fence, uh, thinking, you know, I just want to find a friendly face or they'll see my face as friendly. And then this line, I think, is really important. When Shamali was as old as Mrs. Dutta, she would know that too. Okay. So, and why I think that's an important moment, okay, is that Mrs. Dutta is convinced in her rightness. And when Molly says, well, it's not done here this way, that Mrs. Dutta believes everybody likes a friendly face, therefore Molly is wrong. Okay. And so, I, I mean, one word we could use is that she's stubborn or she's very set in her ways. Okay. But she also believes in certain truths, which are true perhaps in India, which don't travel so well perhaps into the suburbs of California. Okay. So um, let's turn then to. Oh. Um, Let's turn then to the, the sort of the confrontation, I guess we could call it, on page uh, 764. Okay, so finally, there's a neighbor, and, you know, Mrs. Dutta noticed her before, you know, the woman with the blonde hair, and the, she's smoking. And um, it's, um, and all the time when she's writing back to Roma, she's trying to put as positive a spin on it as, as possible. But, you know, she seems to be sort of more fooling herself than else. And in the end, of course, she's going to write a more honest letter to Roma, not this one that she's been thinking about uh, sending, you know, the, the kind of nicer version of it. Um, and so that neighbor apparently complained to Molly. Um, and so let's look now at um, it saying, you know, the woman, you know, tell, tell the woman not to hang clothes on the back fence. And then, uh, so Sagar, who's kind of caught in between his mother and his uh, wife, uh, you know, and maybe isn't very, you know, very good about standing up to his mother. Um, and so she says, you know, can okay, just calm down, calm down. So she says, Molly, uh, a little bit more than halfway down the page, 764, it's easy for you to say calm down. I'd like to see how calm you'd be if she came up to you and said, kindly tell the old lady not to hang her clothes over the fence into my yard. She said it twice, like I didn't understand English, like I was an idiot. All these years, I've been so careful not to give these Americans a chance to say something like this. And now, okay, and you might say, Molly, why do you care? Okay, but again, it's her house. And so if she cares, she gets to care. Shh, she, Molly, she, I said I talked to mother about it. You always say that, but you never do anything. You're too busy being the perfect son, tiptoeing around her feelings. But what about mine? Hush, Molly, the children, let them hear. I don't care anymore. They're not stupid. They already know what a hard time I've been having with her. You're the only one who refuses to see it. So Mrs. Dada is overhearing this, of course. In the passage, Mrs. Dada shrinks against the wall. She wants to move away, to not hear anything else, but her feet are formed of cement, impossible to lift. And Molly's words pour into her ears like smoking oil. So this is that moment sort of, of epiphany. Okay, she's about to sort of recognize and understand something she didn't get before. Okay, this is climactic moment, I think. I've explained over and over, and she still keeps on doing what I've asked her not to do, throwing away perfectly good food, leaving dishes to drip all over the countertops, ordering my children to stop doing things I've given them permission for. She's taken over the entire kitchen, cooking whatever she likes. You come in the door, and the smell of grease is everywhere, in all our clothes. I feel like this isn't my house anymore. Be patient, Molly. She's an old woman, after all. I know. That's why I've tried so hard. I know having her here is important to you. But I can't do it any longer. I just can't. Some days I feel like taking the kids and leaving. Shamali's voice disappears into a sob. And here I think is the ultimate climax right here. A shadow stumbles across the wall to her. And then another. So those are the children joining her. Behind the weatherman's nasal tones announcing a week of sunny days, Mrs. Dutta can hear a high, frightened weeping. The children, she thinks, is probably the first time they've ever seen their mother cry. Well, maybe not. Don't talk like that, sweetheart, Sagara leans forward, his voice too miserable. All the shadows on the wall shiver and merge into a single dark silhouette. So you have to picture it. She can't see them, okay, but she sees a shadow on the wall. And it's this dark, this unit, it's four bodies converging together in a single dark silhouette. Mrs. Dada stares at that silhouette, the solidarity of it. Uh, Sagara and Shimali's murmurs are lost beneath a noise. Is it in her veins, this dry humming? 
the way the taps in Calcutta used to hum when the municipality turned the water off, and after a while she discovers that she has reached her room. In the darkness she lowers herself on to her bed very gently as though her body is made of the thinnest glass, or perhaps ice, she is so cold. She sits for a long time with her eyes closed, while inside her head thoughts whirl faster and faster until they disappear in a gray dust storm. This is her moment of epiphany, okay? Uh, this sort of recognition of something, okay? And we get to the next paragraph. When Pradeep finally calls her to dinner, Mrs. Dada follows him to the kitchen where she fries luchis for everyone. The perfect circles of dough, puffing up crisp and golden as always. Zagar and Shamali have reached a truce of some kind. She gives him a small smile, and she puts on a casual hand, uh, puts out a casual hand to massage the back of her neck. He puts out a hand. Mrs. Dada demonstrates no embarrassment at this. She eats her dinner. She answers questions put to her. She smiles when someone makes a joke. Her face is st stiff, uh, as though she's been given a shot of Novocaine no one says. Okay, and then she goes back upstairs to finish the letter. And let's take a look at that. She sits down. And she's trying to write this positive note. And she's thinking, oh, if I, you know, tell them the truth, um, then, you know, everybody will think, oh, Cigar, you know, isn't a very good son. Okay, so don't, you know, did you hear about this? Did you hear about what happened to her? Can't get along with the daughter-in-law. And so uh, page uh, 766, this much surely she owes to Cigar. But what does she owe herself, Mrs. Dutta? Falling through black night with all the certainty she trusted in collapsed upon themselves like imploded stars, and only an image inside her eyeballs for company. A silhouette, man, wife, children, joined on a wall showing her how alone she is in this land of young people, and how unnecessary. And so that, I think, is her epiphany, okay? She comes to Sunnydale. She comes to America with all of these certainties. Remember, she said, oh, Molly will understand it when she gets to be my age, that everybody likes a friendly that was one of her certainties, okay? Or you don't keep your dirty laundry where you keep your gods. Uh, that was one of her certainties. Or you don't recycle food, okay? Uh, once you throw perfectly good food away instead of putting it in the refrigerator, okay? So these are all of her certainties. There are right ways of doing things, and Molly just doesn't get it, okay? All of these certainties that she brings with her from India, from her culture, collapse upon themselves like imploded star. And then there's only uh, this image left, the silhouette, with no room for her and how unnecessary. So when we reach a climax like that, oftentimes it's good to pause over and say, okay, well, what is the conflict for which this is the climax? Okay, if that makes sense. If this is the climax, then this is when that conflict has reached its pitch, its highest point. Uh, and in this case, I think she has an epiphany, this recognition, okay? And so to me, the conflict really is, and there's different ways of shading this, but sort of in broad strokes, I would say, um, the conflict is between her desire or her, her desire to live her life, uh, uh, her Indian life in America, which includes being very helpful. She wants to be a part of the family. She wants to be a contributor to the family, okay? but for a variety of reasons, and I don't think we can point to one person. A variety of reasons is she simply can't be that person. She can't be the helpful person she wants to be, okay? Um, and so what is the resolution? You know, what is it that we decide in the end? What do we resolve in the end? And in the end, uh, she writes a letter to her friend saying, I'm coming home. <laughs> I thought happiness was being with family. I, I still kind of think that, but I'm just not sure what happiness is. Maybe we'll figure it out together. And she's going to go back home. Pausing to read over what she had written, last line of the, the story. Mrs. Dada is surprised to discover this. Now she no longer cares whether tears blot her letter. She feels no need to weep. So she's no longer sad. She has resolved her conflict. If the conflict is, my place is with my family, and yet I seem not to be necessary or even helpful. In fact, I seem to be a hindrance. And there's no room for me in that silhouette on the wall then I need to go to a different place. I need to absent myself from this place. It didn't work out. Okay? And I think in the end, it's a happy ending. Uh, the tears are dried. It's sort of sad that she can't you know, find her place. Um, and I'm sure you know, it's, it's, it's sad for everybody involved, even Molly to a certain degree. Um, but I think it's a happy ending in as much as they would drive each other crazy. Okay? And so 
uh, we'd say the conflict is her desire to be helpful, the desire to find a, a, a role in the family, and the facts on the ground of living in suburban America uh, uh, and, um, you know, two working parents working very hard and just sort of the facts of those, the culture is just too different for her to be able to live her Indian life without being uh, a, really a nuisance uh, to the family. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's look at uh, marriage is a private affair, because in some ways it deals with some of the same issues, doesn't it? It's about culture and family. Okay, so in this story, Marriage is a Private Affair, um, written by Shunue Ashebe, he's a Nigerian um, writer. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we don't start with the protagonist, and just whoever it is that we start with, don't assume that that's the protagonist, okay? Uh, who is the person who actually has the biggest conflict in the story? Um, and who do we stay with the most? Even though we don't start with Jonathan, the father, Okiki, uh, we mostly stay with him, okay? And the story starts with Nimeke um, and Nini saying, well, have you written to your dad? You know, we're going to get married. So he's gotten engaged, which is uh, on his own with a woman who lives in Lagos in the, the capital city. And um, it's like, well, I'll, I'll go tell him, you know, you know your father, you know, he's, uh, this needs to be handled carefully, okay? And so what we find out is that um, in the culture uh, where Nemeka is from, is uh, it's not up for him to choose his own uh, bride, okay? Um, if we turn to 586, um, and so he, it turns out that the father has pick somebody else for him who he's not interested in at all okay and so he's home and uh the father is very christian okay so obviously in nigeria um that christianity reached there by missionaries uh, many decades before on the second evening of his return from lagos nemeka sat with his father under a cassia tree this was the old man's retreat where he went to read his bible when the parching December sun had set a, and uh, had set and a fresh reviving wind blew on the leaves. Father began to make a suddenly, I have come to ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness? For what, my son? He asked in amazement. It's about this marriage question. Which marriage question? I can't, we must, I mean, it is impossible for me to marry Nuike's daughter. Impossible? Why? asked his father. I don't love her. Nobody said you did. Why should you? He asked. Okay, and so, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, from his culture, well, you don't need to love your wife. You know, why, why should you? Uh, marriage is, today is different. Look here, my son, interrupted his father. Nothing is different. What one looks for in a wife are a good character and a Christian background. To make a saw there was no hope along the present line of argument. Okay, so he's not going to be able to talk his father out of, uh, you know, that he can't, he doesn't want to marry um, the woman that his father's picked out for him. Moreover, he said, here it comes. I'm engaged to marry another girl who has all of Ugule's good qualities and who... His father did not believe his ears. What did you say? He asked slowly and disconcertingly. She is a good Christian, his son went on, and a teacher in a girl's school in Lagos. Okay. And then he, the father points out that, well, according to St. Paul, uh, women are not supposed to teach. They are supposed to keep silent. Okay. So that's what his culture, Jonathan's, the father's culture is saying. And then he's saying, you know, well, who is she anyway? And get, gives her name. Um, and so um, page uh, 587. Nene Atang from Calabar. She's the only girl I can marry. This was a very rash reply. And the Mika expected the storm to burst. Okay, so, you know, this is the moment when your, your parents or your folks uh, are really about to explode. But it did not. Sometimes that's worse, isn't it? When you're expecting, okay, here it comes, and then it doesn't come. His father merely walked away into his room. This was most unexpected and perplexed Nemeka. His father's silence was infinitely more menacing than a flood of threatening speech. That night, the old man did not eat. When he sent for Nemeka a day later, he applied all possible ways of discussion, dissuasion. Dissuasion means per persuade something out of something. 
but the young man's heart was hardened, and his father eventually gave him up as lost. Okay, and just to be clear, he doesn't mean that sort of figuratively. Oh, he's lost, you know. You know, he can't find his way. No, he means in a, a moral way. I owe it to you, my son, to you, my son, as a duty to show you what is right and what is wrong. So, from uh, in Okiki's point of view, it's not just a matter of hey, this is our culture and you should follow it. For him, it's a matter of right and wrong. Whoever put this idea into your head, I'll cut off, cut your throat. It is Satan's work. He waved his son away. Okay, so instead of just being sort of disappointed, or I didn't like uh, the woman you picked to be your wife, um, it, instead of it, that, it's for him it's about right and wrong. You will change your mind, father, when you know Nini. I shall never see her, was the reply. From that night, the father scarcely spoke to his son. He did not, however, cease hoping that he would realize how serious was the danger he was heading for. Okay, and so again, from uh, Okiki's point of view, this is about damnation. This is about you are a lost soul if you do this, if you violate the culture. And Nemeka, for his own part, was very deeply affected by his father's grief, but he kept hoping that it would pass away. If it occurred to him that never in the history of this people had a mar man married a woman who spoke a different tongue, he might have been less optimistic. It has never been heard, was the verdict of an old man speaking a few weeks later. So this has just simply never happened before. And because it's never happened before, it's morally wrong. Okay. Uh, and so then they, they talk about it and um, it's, uh, the, the village is talking about it. Of course, they realize you shouldn't talk about it in front of Jonathan because he gets very upset when we do. Um, look then on page uh, 588. For eight years... Okiki would have nothing to do with his son. So just imagine that. Eight years he wants nothing to do with his son. Um, Nemeka only, uh, his son Nemeka, only three times when Nemeka asked to come home and spend his leave did he write to him. I can't have you in my house, he replied on one occasion. It can be no interest to me where or how you spend your leave or your life for that matter. Okay, so he seems to be pretty soured, pretty, pretty done. Right. But of course, we see him, you know, thinking about it. Uh, and what I would suggest is, is sort of like. The more he works to put his son out of his mind, the more his son is on his mind. Right. Uh, the prejudice against Nemeka's marriage was not confined to his little village. But, you know, back in Lagos, there were issues going on there, too. And it turns out that, you know, ultimately they have a they have uh, a happy marriage. Um, if we look down here, the story eventually got, uh, to the little village in the heart of Igbo, the Igbo country that Nemeka and his young wife were, uh, a most happy couple. But his father was one of the few people who knew nothing about this. He always displays, uh, so much temper when his son's name was mentioned that everyone avoided it in his presence by a tremendous effort of will. You know, think about that. By a tremendous effort of will, he had succeeded in pushing his son to the back of his mind. Well, of course, that's impossible. If I say, don't think of a blue elephant, you're going to think of a blue elephant. See, you just did. Okay, and so this tremendous effort of will, he's trying to push his son to the back of his mind. The strain had nearly killed him, but he persevered and won. So clearly, okay, his conflict is between culture what his culture says, and, and his, his version of right and wrong, uh, which is part of his culture, and his desire to have a relationship with his son. Okay, And that is such a conflict that choosing culture over his son um, is, is something that he needs to, that takes a tremendous effort. The strain had nearly killed him, but he had persevered and won. It almost killed him to shut his son out of his life as much as possible. And he had one. And one means that he didn't relent. He didn't say, okay, son, uh, come, in, even just his son, without his, his daughter-in-law. He doesn't want anything to do with either of them. And then one day he receives a letter, of course. And um, it's from his daughter-in-law. And it essentially says, you know, um, you have two grandsons. And once they found out that you exist, they, um, they want to meet you. You know, so is there any way, you know, I'll stay here and, and they go, go and meet you. 
Okay, so the top of page 589. The old man at once felt the resolution he had built up over so many years falling in. He was telling himself that he must not give in. He tried to steel his heart against all emotional appeals. It was reenactment of that other struggle. So again, it was shutting his son out of his life. Now he's going through it again, finding out, oh, wait, I have a grandson. He leaned against the window and looked out. The sky was overcast with heavy black clouds, and a high wind began to blow, filling the air with dust and dry leaves. It was one of those rare occasions when even nature takes a hand in a human fight. Very soon it began to, began to rain, the first rain in the year. So he's having this moment of epiphany, you know, just as the storm clouds are sort of gathering. And of course, the storm is a metaphor for what's going on inside of him. It's a storm, right? The storm is a conflict. Um, Okiki was trying hard not to think of his two grandsons. And again, how do you try hard not to think of something? It's, uh, it doesn't work. But he knew he was now fighting a losing battle. He had tried to hum a favorite hymn, but the pattering of large raindrops on the roof broke up the tune. So nature itself is saying, you're wrong. You're wrong. At least that's how he reads it. His mind immediately returned to the children as much as he was trying not to. How could he shut this, his door against them? By a curious mental process, he imagined them standing, sad and forsaken, under the harsh, angry weather, shut out from his house. And so he, he not only can't shut, shut them out of his brain, he pictures them standing right outside uh, in the rain. Okay, so he can't get them out of his brain, and he's picturing them standing outside, sad and forsaken, in the rain. Okay. That night, he hardly slept from remorse, okay, which tells me he realizes he was wrong, that those eight years that almost killed him trying to shut his son out of his life, he has remorse and a vague fear that he might die without making it up to them. So this idea that he actually has to make it up to him, not only was he wrong, but he is in debt to them. He has to make it up to them. Because uh, he now recognizes that he's wrong. Um, and so if we said the conflict is his desire to have a relationship with his son or to, you know, keep the family, you know, um, to keep his son part of his life or keep the family, you know, somewhat intact. And his desire to maintain his culture. Unlike Mrs. Dada, who said, OK, I'm going to go back to my culture. Uh, Okiki, uh, Okiki, in the end, chooses family, doesn't he? Although it's, uh, it's very late in the game and so late that he's afraid oh my god what if i die uh and i never get a chance to tell them that i was wrong and that i'm sorry okay um so um one question though i always ask students about this is okay you were able to shut your son out of your life for eight years why are you unable to shut therefore your grandsons out of your life your grandchildren OK, this is your son is just your, your only son and then the grandkids. And um, it's really sort of interesting because especially if you uh, maybe you have nieces or nephews or maybe you, you have you have children. And if you ever see your parents with your nieces or nephews or, or with your own children, oftentimes um, they will seem so much more lenient and nicer and kinder and sweeter to their grandchildren, then you remember them being towards you. Um, I know that that's certainly the case when I would bring my um, two or, or three-year-old over to my mom's house. Uh, maybe maybe before we're supposed to have a meal, she would give him ice cream. I say, "You're going to spoil his appetite," and she'll say, "Oh, that's fine. You know, don't worry about it. He's he, you know, it's he'll he'll eat. He's fine." Um, or if I you know, raise my voice, oh, Joey, what are you doing? She'd say, don't you yell at that child. Um, and I remember, boy, you, you yelled at me plenty of times. Okay. So what's really sort of interesting is there's sort of a, a difference, sort of almost a, a, a magical relationship between sort of that grandparents and the grandchildren. Uh, it, and it might be because, well, the grandchildren are perfectly innocent in this, right? That it is a battle between from Okiki's point of view, uh, between him and his son. Okay, and that his son made the choices. That the, the, the son's the one who was the prime instigator of this conflict, this conflict he now has. Okay, but I think Okiki in the end realizes, no, it's an inner conflict between these two desires that I have, and I was wrong. I was wrong to 
hold out against my son and to shut my son out of his life. And it took the fact that my son has children of his own to make me realize that. Okay. I think it's, again, it's um, a happy, upbeat uh, ending. Um, it's sad that we had to go through eight years of this sort of awkwardness and isolation and what could have been glorious eight years of, you know, spending time together and getting to know, uh, it, it, celebrating the, the birth of the grandchildren he didn't even know he had. Okay. Um, but in the end, he realizes, I don't know if he realizes that family is more important than culture, but he does realize that culture should not be such that it shuts family out. Okay. And then finally, um, let's take a look at everyday use. Let's, because uh, again, it's about family, and it's about culture, um, but it's got an interesting twist on it, I think. So let's head on over there. Okay, and finally today we have everyday use, uh, written by Alice Walker. She is a great American uh, novelist, uh, African American novelist, and short story writer. Um, she wrote. Um, the Color Purple, which is an absolute masterpiece. Um, so here we have Mama waiting for her. She has two daughters, Maggie, and Maggie has stayed with her. Maggie is scarred from a, from a fire and stayed with, lives with Mama, whereas Dee went off to college and she went off as her own life. Okay, and now Dee is going to come back to visit. And... Um, you kind of get a hint early on, I think, what it is that Mama, the protagonist, what it is that Mama wants. Uh, and so if we take the right around this uh, on page of 586, you've no doubt seen those TV shows where the child who has made it is confronted as a surprise by her own mother and father, tottering and weakly from backstage. A pleasant surprise, of course. What would they do if a parent and the child came on the show only to curse out and insult each other? On TV, mother and child embrace and smile into each other's faces. Sometimes the father and mother weep. The child wraps them in their arms, leans across the table to tell her, uh, to tell how she would ha not have made it without their help. I have seen these programs. Sometimes I dream a dream in which Dee and I are suddenly brought together on a TV program of this sort. Out of the dark, a soft-seated limousine, I am ushered into a bright room filled with many people. There I meet a smiling, gray, sporting man like Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson was a... a late night uh, talk show host. Uh, uh, Jay Leno, if you know him, took his place. Who shakes my hand and tells me what a fine girl I have. Then we're, then we're on, on stage and Dee is embracing me with tears in her eyes. She pins on my dress a large orchid, even though she has told me once that she thinks orchids are tacky flowers. Okay, and so this is what she wants. She wants her daughter to appreciate her, to, um, you know, just say uh, everything I am is because of you. Okay, she wants her daughter to be successful. So this is kind of her fantasy. Okay, and she wants her daughter to appreciate her. In real life, I'm a large, big-boned woman with rough, man-working hands. In the winter, I wear flannel nightgowns to bed and overalls during the day. I can kill and clean a hog as mercilessly as a man. My fat keeps me hot in zero weather. I can work outside all day, breaking ice to get water for washing. I can eat pork liver cooked over the open fire minutes after it comes steaming from the hog. Okay, and so this is a, a woman who can do things. She can take care of herself. She can handle herself. Okay. Um, uh, and she's, she can survive. Okay. Uh, one winter I knocked a bull calf straight in the brain between the eyes with a sledgehammer and had the meat hung up to chill before nightfall. But of course, all this does not show on television. So we're back to her fantasy. I'm the way my daughter would want me to be a hundred pounds lighter, my skin like uncooked an uncooked barley pancake. My hair glistens in the hot, bright lights. Johnny Carson has much to do to keep up with my quick and witty tongue. Okay, so she has this fantasy of the sort of person. She wishes she was the sort of person that um, her daughter could appreciate. She wishes she were lighter skinned. She wishes she were a little bit, 100 pounds lighter, a little bit more quick witted. Okay, and so we find out that D went away. She was sort of the, the you know, the belle of the family. And uh, off she goes, uh, and then she's returning. And so we, we still hear about this, okay? And so moving on, on page 589. So Dee gets, she arrives. She says, don't get up, Dee says. Since I am stout, it takes something of a push. You can see me trying to move a second or two before I make it. 
She turns, showing white heels through her sandals, and goes back to the car. Out she peeks next with a Polaroid. She stoops down quickly and lines up picture after picture of me sitting there in front of the house with Maggie cowering behind me. She never takes a shot without making sure the house is included. When a cow comes nibbling around the edge of the yard, she snaps it and me and Maggie and the house. Then she puts the Polaroid in the back seat of the car and comes up and kisses me on the forehead. Okay, so let me start with the, the kiss. Kiss on the forehead. I don't. That seems kind of condescending. You know, that's that's just the me that you, you kiss a child that way, just sort of on the forehead or the top of the head or something like that, okay? But what's interesting is why would she want these pictures? She went off to college, become educated, and to join, you know, the middle to upper middle classes, okay, is the sense that we get. And yet she comes back and she wants to take a picture of Maggie and her mother and the, the house and the cow, okay? And because what she's searching for in this return, I think we come to understand, is a sense of her identity and her desire to sort of embrace her, her past, to embrace her culture, at least, or her heritage, as she understands the terms, okay? But for her, culture or heritage probably doesn't mean the same thing that it means to Mama or Maggie. We're going to turn now to um, page 590. Uh, they're eating, and they're eating their traditional meal. Oh, Mama, she cried, then turned to Hakima Barba. I never knew how lovely these benches were. You can feel the rump print, she said, running her hands underneath her and along the bench. Then she gave a sigh, and her hand closed over Grandma D's butter dish. That's it, she said. I knew there was something I wanted to ask you if I could have. She jumped up from the table and went over in the, went over in the corner where the churn stood. The milk and its clabber by now. She looked at the churn, and... It, she, she looked at the churn and looked at it. Okay, so a butter churn is sort of like, um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of bucket shaped with a long bucket. And there's a cover and then you, you churn it um, with, the, with what's called a dasher, okay? And in other words, you're turning it into when you're churning butter, okay? Um, and the fact that the milk in his clabber, there was still milk in it means that Mama and, and Maggie, still use this butter churn, okay? And they use it, to quote the title of the short story, they use it every day. They put it to everyday use, don't they? This churn top is what I need, she said. Didn't Uncle Buddy whittle it out of a tree you all used to have? Yes, I said. Uh-huh, she said happily, and I want the dasher too. Uncle Buddy whittled that too, asked the barber. <laughs> so he's not a barber, but Hakeem a barber is part of his name. And so, and Mama knows that. She's throwing a little sarcasm to us. D. Wangero looked up at me. Aunt Dee's first husband whittled the dash, said Maggie, so low you almost couldn't hear her. His name was Henry, but they called him Stash. Okay, so Maggie knows the history of the items in this household. Maggie's brain is like an elephant, when Jero said, laughing. I can use the churn top as a centerpiece for the alcove table, she said, sliding a plate over the churn. And I'll think of something artistic to do with the dasher. So she's taking these items that they actually use every day. They use to churn butter, for example, and she wants to make them some sort of artifacts in her home. The churn top is a centerpiece for the alcove table. So she has an alcove in her. I doubt that um, Mama and Maggie have an alcove in their uh, cabin, but she has uh, lives in a fancy enough place that it has an alcove, and she wants to do something and something artistic with the dasher. So in some ways, she's, she's raiding items that are being put to everyday use and doing so i think to kind of i don't know maybe with the polaroids is to show off to her fancy well-educated friends what her you know origins or her roots she's she's proud of her roots at a distance okay she's not going to take the butter turn so she could bring it to wherever she lives now and turn butter right she's going to instead make them some sort of exhibits uh, that reflect ultimately, I guess, positively on her, makes her seem more sort of authentic, okay? Uh, then she goes off and she grabs, of course, the quilts, okay? Uh, top of, towards the top of 591. Mama, when Jero said, sweet as a bird, can I have these old quilts? I heard something fall in the kitchen. A minute later, the kitchen door slammed. So that's Maggie thinking, okay, yeah, she's, she gets everything. Why don't you take one of the one or two others? Uh, I, I asked. These old things was was just done by me and Big D from some tops your grandma, uh, grandma piece before she died. 
No, Angero said. I don't want those. They're stitched around the border by machine. That'll make them last better, I said. The mom was practical. That's not the point, said Wenjero. These are all pieces of dresses Grandma used to wear. She did all this stitching by hand. Imagine. She held the quilt securely in her arms, stroking them. Well, Mama doesn't have to imagine. Mama was there when it happened. And quilting is part of Mama's heritage, culture. Not having quilts, but quilting. Okay? Not something you put up on a wall, but something you use every day. Um, some of these pieces, like lavender ones, come from old clothes her mother handed down to her, I said, moving up to touch the quilts. D. Ranchero moved back just enough so that I couldn't reach the quilts. They already belonged to her, she believes. It's like, no, no, I don't even want you touching them. Imagine, she breathed again, clutching them closely to her bosom. The truth is, I said, I promised to give them quilts to Maggie for when she marries John Thomas. <gasps> she gasped like a bee had stung her. Maggie can't appreciate these quilts, she said. She'd probably be backwards enough to put them to everyday use. I reckon she would. I said, God knows I've been saving them long enough for nobody, with nobody using them. I hope she will. I didn't want to bring up to her how I had offered Dee when Gerald a quilt when she went away to college. Then she had told me that they're old-fashioned and out of style. But they're priceless, she was saying now furiously, for she had a temper. Maggie would put them on the bed, and in five years, they'd be in rags. Less than that. She can always make some more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. So Maggie and Mama are living the heritage that Dee wants to turn into something uh, almost like an art form. It's, it's almost as if she doesn't want, of course, she doesn't want to move back home and live the life. She wants to make it something to decorate her home with, okay? Dee looked at me with hatred. You just will not understand. The point is these quilts, these quilts. Well, I said, stumped, what would you do with them? Hang them, she said, as if that's the only thing you could do with quilts. Maggie by now was standing in the door. I could hear the sound uh, her feet made as they scraped over each other. She can have them, Mama, she said, like somebody used to never winning anything or having anything reserved for her. I can remember Grandma D without the quilt. And she can. In fact, she can quilt herself, can't she? I looked at her hard. So there's Mama looking at Maggie. She had filled her bottom, bottom lip with checkerberry snuff, and it gave her face a kind of dopey hangdog look. It was Grandma D and Big D who taught her how to quilt herself. She stood there with her scarred hands hidden in the folds of her skirt. She looked at her sister with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. That's how Maggie saw the world. This was the way she knew God to work. She gets nothing, D gets whatever she wants. Here comes the epiphany. Okay, again, it's one of these sort of moments where, ah, aha moment. When I looked at her like that, something hit me on the top of the head and ran down to the soles of my feet. Just like when I'm in church and the Spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout. I did something I've never done before. Hug Maggie to me. I doubt she's never hugged Maggie before. But in other words, in one of these types of moments, she's done something she's never done before. And that's to take Maggie's side. Then dragged her on into the room, snatched the quilts out of Miss Wanjero's hands, dumped them into Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on my bed with her mouth open. So she's going to get to keep the quilts. Take one or two of the others, I said to Dee, but she turned without a word and went out to Hakima Barber. You just don't understand, she said, as Maggie and I came out of the car. What don't I understand, I wanted to know. Your heritage, she said. Okay, so <clears throat> if, ever, <laughs> if ever you wanted to climb inside of a short story and yell at somebody, here's your moment. Because when Dee says, you don't understand your heritage, Mama and Maggie are living that heritage. They, are, they understand their heritage by the way they live their lives. Now, I don't expect, you know, I, I don't fault D for leaving behind that life if that's not the life she wanted to live, okay? But I think we could say that don't be so condescending when you think of heritage as something you put up on the wall as opposed to something that you live. And then she turned to Maggie, kissed her, and said, you ought to try to make something of yourself too, Maggie. It really is a new day for us. From the way you and Mama still live, you would never know it. So show how what contempt she has towards the way that Mama and Maggie are living. Sure, it, you know, nice quilt, something you put on a wall, and a uh, churn top you can put in an alcove. And even to say something so condescending is you ought to make something of yourself too, Maggie. Maggie maybe Maggie is perfectly happy with the life she was living. 
Um, and she doesn't need D to try to make her feel, you know, uh, lesser than. Okay. She put on some sunglasses that hit everything above the tip of her nose. Maggie smiled, maybe at the sunglasses. So even Maggie, I think, can realize that in some ways, D is a ridiculous figure. Okay. Uh, but a real smile, not uh, scared. After we watched the car dust settle, I asked Maggie to bring me a dip of snuff. And then the two of us sat there just enjoying until it's time to go in the house and go to bed. Okay. So if we look at Mama and we saw what it is she wanted, she wanted her daughter to appreciate her. And she even had this fantasy that she would be more like the type of mother she knows her daughter wishes she had. Okay. But she just desires her daughter to, uh, to appreciate her. Okay. Well, <clears throat> and, and, and that's why... Uh, D is visiting, or change your name to Langero, but D is visiting to um, um, seemingly, you know, visit and hi, and wanted to see you and all this. Well, it turns out she's the th just there to pillage some items to prove her authenticity, I think. Uh, it's pretty clear to maybe her, her fancier friends, right? Um, uh, she doesn't want any real connection. She wants Polaroids of her mother and the house and the cow and Maggie, but she doesn't really want to fully embrace that lifestyle. And so when she says, you don't understand your heritage, it's really galling, isn't it? Because of course, mom and Maggie so well understand their heritage, they live in their heritage, okay? So if we said what mama wants is for her daughter to appreciate her, what did the epiphany, that moment where boom, she's hit on the top of the head, just like when she's in church and it was down to the, the soles of her feet and she grabs the quilts and gives them to Maggie. Okay. So to me, that's her moment of epiphany. And I think what, what eventually she realizes is I am never going to get from D what it is that I want. Okay. I, D will never appreciate me not only for who she wishes I was, uh, but for who I really am. I will never get that from D. And it's just because that's not how D is wired, right? It's D's basic D-ness that keeps that from happening. But she is getting that from Maggie. Maggie so, um, uh, so embraces Mama, so appreciates Mama, that she is living her life uh, as Mama lives her, her life, right? And so she, um, uh, in the end, she and Maggie are sitting out there but they're chewing t uh, tobacco, and that's what snuff is, and uh, just enjoying each other's company, okay? Just enjoying the life that they have together. So, Mama, you could say to her, how, how was the, the conflict resolved? Um, well, you're not going to get what you wanted from D, but now you recognize you do get that from Maggie, okay? So don't expect that from D, but be happy you are getting it from Maggie. Maggie is... Um, showing you how she feels about culture and heritage by living it. Okay? Again, I would say not all our short stories are happy endings, but I think in the end here, um, this sort of recognition, I'm not going to get what I'm asking for. It's probably ultimately healthy. Okay, guys. Um, so that's the reading for today. Don't forget to take uh, the reading uh, slash lecture quiz, uh, and we will talk to you next time. Bye now.